e kuima e koronga, e ngā tuakana e ngā teina o te moana nui aki wai. Nau mai haramai ki tēnei wahanga o te hui huinga mo tēnei rā, a tēnā kūtau, tēnā kūtau, kia ora mai tātou. E mihi kauana tēnei, kia kūtau, nō te hāpori i taia mai ki te pakarongo, ki te rangatira rā, ki te ariki ei, i ngū mai ki te whare wānu mō tātou ki pōneke, ki au koe te rangatira, a tēnā anō hoki koe e kawa. Tāno hoki, whawhetai, a sponga, tēnā. Tāno atu, e ngā paupakahaere, ngā kaiwakahaere, tēnā tātou katoa. Huri noa, he mihi iti tēnā ki o koutou, ki a harihari te mahana o tēnei kōrero, mō tēnei pō, hei whaka mahana tō ngākau, me o taringa, ki tā whakarongo ki nei kōrero nō te moana nui a kiwa, nō nui, mō tātou nō te moana nui a kiwa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a kia ora mai tātou. Ladies and gentlemen, just opening as we do, and acknowledging our distinguished guest this evening, but before we hear from our Professor Dr. Colin Tukui-Tunga, I would like to just hand it over to our Associate Dean of Pacifica, Dr. and Professor Diane Sikabalti. Kia ora. Mā loe le lei, tālo whalawa, kia ora ana. Wall Pacific Regions, Nisa Polinaka, Mā loe ni, tālo wha, tēnā koutou katoa. Wall Pacific Regions again to you all. On behalf of the University of Otago Wellington and our Dean and Head of Campus, Professor Sunny Collins, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, but together with the Otago Global Health Institute, it is my privilege and honour to extend a very warm and specific welcome to you all here as we gather together for the 2019 Macaulay Oration. Firstly, to Mr Tom Waka, we thank you so much for that very kind and special welcome tonight for all of us here and for opening this event in such an important and special way. And also to our many esteemed guests, and there are a lot of you here tonight, uh, our conference delegates, our other visitors, and all of you who've made an effort to be here, we welcome you all. So this year, at the University of Otago Medical School campus, we are truly honoured to be hosting the Otago Global Health Institute Conference, which is running over the next two days, and has featured some amazing speakers. And not only that, but in addition, we've had the 2019 Macaulay Oration here at our campus for the very first time. So these two very special events are quite important for us here. And they have both also had a very strong Pacific focus. And this is highly relevant to our work that we've been doing here. In that here at medical school, we've just opened a new Pacific office where we're seeking to support and build our Pacific staff and student numbers we're looking to encourage more Pacific health-related research and researchers. Uh, we're also ensuring that there is um, Pacific health-related teaching content going into our curricula, and also, importantly, ensuring that we're connecting not just with our local Pacific communities, but also with our wider Pacific community network, networks and partners. Last but not least, we're also seeking to ensure that we are building a health and training, a health workforce that is not just culturally responsive, but is also reflective of the communities that it seeks to serve. And so tonight we are incredibly honoured to have Dr. Colin Dunkwidonga, who has worked on behalf of our Pacific peoples and our communities for such a long time, and who has accepted the invitation to be here this evening. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have been asked to just provide a, a little bit of background about the Macaulay Oration, so a little bit of history. So this oration is actually held in honour of Catherine Macaulay, who founded the Sisters of Mercy in the 19th century. And so this oration is in honour of her work. And acknowledging also that they also funded what's called the Macaulay Chair in International Health at the University of Otago, which is held by Philip. So, that was the informal part of the welcome. Now there's also a, a formal part to come. 
Dr. Kondur Budama is a prominent New Zealander of Niuean heritage and Director General of the Secretariat for the Pacific Community, which is a regional intergovernmental organization in Numea, New Caledonia. He is also a medical doctor with comprehensive experience in primary health care, health care policy research, but also international public health. In addition to this, he has held various senior leadership and management roles in public sector organisations in New Zealand and internationally. So his roles here in New Zealand have included the Chief Executive Officer of the Ministry of Pacific Island Affairs, so now known as the Ministry of Pacific Peoples, the Director of Public Health at our Ministry of Health, Associate Professor at the University of Auckland, the Auckland District Health Board and Health Research Council of New Zealand as board members on both of these teams. As a prominent Pacific leader, Dr. Colin Dukwidong has also been of service for our Pacific communities in these roles internationally outside of Aotearoa, which, in addition to his role at SPC, includes being the Head of Surveillance and Prevention of Non-Communicable Diseases at the WHO in Switzerland, an academic at Fiji School of Medicine, a member of the Independent External Review of SPC, which was undertaken in 2012, and being a commissioner for the WHO Global Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. In his spare time, Dr. Colin is also a founding member of the New Way Arts and Culture Festival, the Pacific Language Weeks that we celebrate here in New Zealand, and also the Leadership Development Programme for Pacific Civil Servants in New Zealand. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please join with me and welcome Dr. Colin Duiguidonga, who will be presenting the 2019 Macaulay Oration. Uh, good evening, all. Um, kia ora. Aloha lahiatu. It's a real pleasure to be here. Tēnā koe toa e hoa. Oh, he's gone. Thank you for that. Uh, Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Diane. Uh, you, are, you are very generous. I want to say thank you to uh, Professor Richard Edwards for the kind invitation and um, uh, to, to be part of this uh, event uh, and also to all of you who've uh, elected to use your evening and take a chance on seeing what I have to say. I, I want to apologize to some of you who've heard some of this before. I think you know I've been going on at some length about NCDs. I'll, I'll speak about it at every moment that somebody puts a microphone in my face. So I apologize if you've heard some of this before. Uh, the, the talk, of course, is uh, um, um, the Macaulay oration and I want to acknowledge uh, that contribution and to say thank you again to uh, Richard uh, and the team for the, uh, it's a pleasure and an honour to uh, deliver the Macaulay oration for uh, 2019. The title of course is uh, Global Health in the Era of Climate Change but I think you'll see that I'm in fact now not use the word change. There are several people who are now uh, pushing and encouraging a bit more ur urgency in this. So I, I, I will use uh, crisis. I know in the last few days, there's some significant group of scientists who are calling it an, an emergency to, to signify, of course, that uh, what we're doing is uh, not enough and not uh, fast enough. Um, so I've elected to speak on what I call the dual uh, crisis uh, affecting the health and well-being of uh, Pacific uh, people. Um, uh, you'll hear in a minute, whilst they might sound dis two distinct uh, crises, they, they are uh, uh, connected, of course. Um, and so I, I want to uh, use a little time to just give some context for what we're uh, talking about. Um, then talk about uh, non-communicable uh, diseases, the health impacts of climate change, of, of the climate uh, crisis. Richard also asked me to say a few words about research uh, priorities and uh, opportunities. Uh, from, from my perspective, I know there was a workshop on this uh, this morning. 
uh, a lot of people helped me put this together. The one person in particular, uh, who's a lot of a lot of the slides I've uh, pinched, is uh, Dr. Paula uh, Vivili, a colleague at uh, SBC. Uh, so just uh, some context. Uh, obviously, the Pacific Ocean is a big, uh, big blue. It is a defining feature for those of us who call ourselves Pacific. Uh, an important point in the first part here is the fact that for communities in the Pacific, 80% of their protein come from the sea. That's why the ocean and the sea is so important, at least from a nutrition point of view. Uh, most of the people in the Pacific are in uh, Melanesia and very young, as you would know, half the population under one. The big threat for us, of course, now uh, is uh, pollution of the Pacific Ocean, overfishing and illegal uh, fishing. Uh, and I want you all to note that those of us who live and work in the Pacific are very annoyed about this because pollution in the Pacific comes from outside the region, from three countries mainly to the east of us, and overfishing is not done by Pacific people. Traditionally, Pacific people just take enough for what they need. But now we have outsiders, we call them, who come in and pretty much decimate uh, the best uh, sea cucumber fishery in the Pacific is pretty well non-existent because they've been um, pillaged by people who come into the Pacific uh, from outside. And, and so you can deduce from this that Pacific folk who call the Pacific uh, home are, are rather unhappy about uh, what's happening to our resource. Uh, it's a region of contrast. Those of you who followed the politics, of course, uh, China and uh, its role in the region is uh, uh, large at the present time. And of course the reaction from Australia, New Zealand, US uh, is somewhat uh, predictable. From our point of view, it's nice to be noticed. It's nice to be uh, wanted. It is somewhat uh, naive, I think, the, the discussion because China has been in the region for a very long time uh, and whether we like it or not, they are invited by our, our leaders and many of the countries. And in the last uh, few weeks, two of the uh, island nations have elected to align with uh, China instead of their traditional uh, friend, uh, Taiwan. A lot of this you will know, um, not, not uh, very healthy economies, except a few chronic, um, long-term uh, educational underachievement, which leads to low skill uh, and consequently low incomes. One of the big topics of my talk this evening is about water. I think we have lost focus uh, on some of what I think uh, important basics like uh, access to clean water. And NCDs, of course, uh, is uh, I think a factor mainly of the importation and consumption of highly processed, uh, salted, sugared uh, uh, food washed down with uh, fizzy drinks. And there's really no control over the importation of those products into the region. Uh, we still struggle in terms of relative uh, priorities. Uh, generally, uh, island nations uh, prioritize economic objectives over health. But it was encouraging for those of you who watch politics in the region in Tuvalu, August this year, September, whenever the forum leaders meeting was, they elected to put health as a standing agenda item on their annual meeting. And we think those of us who are concerned with the health of people in the Pacific think that that's a fantastic opportunity and it is important that we use it uh, uh, con constructively. Uh, a vision for the region uh, produ provided, produced by the Forum Island leaders uh, that we all work towards. Um, it, it is uh, noble, it is uh, aspirational, but uh, of course uh, we're some way away. 
Um, I, I just put this up because I don't want you to think that there are really only two, uh, Im two important uh, challenges in the region, because um, there are many others. Population growth, for example, still is a big issue. Fortunately, it is uh, somewhat limited to pockets uh, around the region. Uh, sexual and reproductive health and women's health issue, Alec knows a lot about. It still remains one of our big, uh, big issues. Um, the youth and uh, their expectations, their education and participation. Uh, mental health, mental uh, well-being continues to be a challenge. Under-resourced, not well understood, uh, and services by and large inadequate. Uh, infectious diseases and health security. So um, I, I, I just put that up because I think it's important to, to think about the two that I'm going to talk about uh, in the context of a whole range of uh, other issues. Uh, this is some work from uh, Don Matheson actually. Uh, he reviewed the Healthy Islands uh, initiative some years back. And, and the, uh, the thing about this slide, as you can see, is that the rest of the world seems to have passed us by. For the longest time, the Pacific, in fact, uh, did better. This is uh, uh, under five mortality. Uh, compared to the rest of the world, we did okay. In about uh, 2007, 8, uh, I think we stood still, but the, the rest of the world moved on. Uh, if you look at uh, life expectancy, Nothing much uh, has uh, changed. The difference between the rest of the world and the Pacific has remained constant pretty much over the last uh, two decades. Uh, this uh, here is uh, child mortality, some work done by uh, our, our team at SBC. And as you can see, for both infant mortality and under five mortality, there's been a commendable decline. And this is from a number of sources, uh, so we think that this uh, trend, this encouraging trend is, uh, is actually real and welcomed. Um, so we're doing something uh, right in respect of uh, infant and child mortality in the region. Uh, if you look at the other end, of course, uh, the news is not so good. Uh, this is life expectancy in Fiji, and as you can see for both men and women, it looks like uh, it's leveled off. Um, there's some in that country who question the trend, but we are pretty confident uh, with our work that this in fact uh, is a reflection of uh, a static or possibly declining life expectancy in Fiji. By the way, it's also, uh, you can see it in Nauru, uh, Perhaps in, in Nauru a bit more traumatic because it's really in the low 50s for men and around hovering around 60 for women. And we think in, in Nauru it's actually uh, declined. Uh, if you look at Papua New Guinea, again the uh, reduction in child mortality is there as well. Um, often people have a misunderstanding of the situation in uh, Papua New Guinea. But uh, the team who put this together are pretty confident that uh, there has been a, a genuine decline in infant mortality and under five mortality in Papua New Guinea. But again, if you look at life expectancy in uh, Papua New Guinea, leveling off in the mid 50s uh, for men and uh, similarly for, for women. And we think that the decline in uh, life expectancy is attributable to uh, NCDs largely. Uh, so this is a, a significant uh, finding for us in the region who work with governments to try to help them uh, put programs uh, in place uh, to address some of these issues. Um, so uh, tonight's uh, discussion is, uh, is on the dual crisis threatening health and, and well-being but as I signaled at the beginning they are not as separate as we might uh, imagine. Uh, and Boyd, uh, Swinburne and a few others uh, describe it as a syndemic. Um, they're actually much closely related uh, and not uh, independent uh, threats as some might imagine. So for example, threats to food security from natural disasters will drive nations towards rice, flour, noodles uh, and soft drinks. And conversely, 
uh, uh, NCDs uh, limit the uh, capacity of nations to prepare for and respond effectively to the health impacts of the climate crisis. One thing I do want to stress is I, I explain to people that the climate crisis in our region uh, makes worse what already exists. The climate crisis does not introduce new threats. Uh, so for example, access to clean water in our region at the best of time is uh, problematic. Even in Fiji, for example, only half of the population have access to clean water. And what climate change does is makes things even more difficult. That's why I call it uh, an effect uh, multiplier. So in uh, 2016, uh, SBC, USAID, and a number of partners did a, a study of uh, food security in six of the Pacific Island nations. Um, and uh, the findings there were pretty consistent that all six nations were highly vulnerable and with very limited uh, adaptive uh, capacity. Uh, and the implication of the study was that uh, there would be increasing reliance on imported foods, thus making worse the incidence of uh, NCDs. So let me uh, just turn now to uh, NCDs. Uh, you may recognize the person standing up in the... This was uh, back in uh, 2011 when the leaders met here, met in Auckland and they, uh, they had declared the region to uh, be in a NCD uh, crisis. The photograph uh, here is a meeting of uh, health ministers uh, and uh, uh, economic uh, or finance ministers in uh, Solomon Islands. And so the region has always been a bit sensitive and aware of the impact of climate, uh, of, uh, uh, NCDs on the populations of the region and they declared the uh, NCD crisis uh, back in 2010-2011. Uh, so it's a big issue for us, three out of every four deaths is attributable to uh, NCD and it is a significant cause of morbidity and disability in our region. High, uh, very high and rising uh, risk uh, factor burden such as uh, smoking uh, and uh, obesity, and it does uh, impact uh, largely the economically productive age groups of the small islands of our region. And one of the um, discussions we're having with many of our members is the, the potential of NCDs to limit uh, their development uh, prospects. Large and uh, we think unsustainable costs of providing uh, health care and in uh, many families in the region, uh, someone with a, a, a serious uh, NCD can have a catastrophic uh, effect on the family. So we've always had a, a, a good uh, level of political awareness and political commitment. But unfortunately, as you'll see in a bit, uh, that level of political commitment has not been translated into resources for uh, taking action to prevent and control uh, NCDs. Uh, smoking remains a big issue for us in the region. High and very high rates of smoking, uh, mostly in uh, men, but of course in some places like Nauru and French Polynesia, there are more women than men who smoke. Uh, but as you can see in the case of uh, Kiribati, uh, almost 80% of the population uh, smoke. So as uh, smoking uh, declines in New Zealand and Australia, the industry is uh, peddling their products in our region. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about this uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh, if you take uh, alcohol, it's become entrenched in many of the cultures of the Pacific. You'd think that alcohol has always uh, been part of the cultures. It's actually one of our most uh, significant uh, problem. It is the reason for high, part of the reason for high levels of uh, violence against women and girls. And it's a, certainly a major contributor to road uh, traffic uh, accidents. 
Uh, there's been uh, several surveys in the region which tell us that alcohol consumption varies considerably um, and the patterns of drinking are, are not like in developed uh, countries. There's uh, fewer people who drink, they drink less often, but they drink huge quantums, quantum of alcohol at, at, uh, at any one uh, sitting. So, uh, and we see this pattern not just in adults, but also in uh, young people. Uh, and as I say, the, um, the controls are terrible. And lots of reasons for that, but alcohol has become so, so entrenched in many of the communities uh, in the Pacific. And it has to be one of the areas of focus for us, uh, I think. Uh, obesity, I don't need to uh, remind you of this. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the, because you have similar rates, uh, similar prevalence uh, here in uh, New Zealand. But I want to point out that in fact, uh, most of the problems appear to be in Polynesia, uh, less so in, uh, in Melanesia, but uh, it's only a matter of time. I mean, their, their, their uh, dietary habits are uh, changing uh, dramatically as well. Um, as a result of that, uh, you, we see uh, very high rates of uh, diabetes uh, in pretty much uh, uh, all the nations uh, of the region. Um, type 2 diabetes uh, mainly. Uh, so, um, I've spent a bit of time describing the problem. What are we doing about it? In 2012, there was a report uh, conducted by the World Bank, uh, which basically pr uh, pointed out that uh, uh, most of the things we already know, that NCDs impose large uh, financial and economic uh, costs on Pacific nations, uh, and the risk factors in the Pacific are feeding a pipeline of uh, pretty expensive NCD uh, conditions, such as uh, diabetes and uh, heart disease. And from a public health and public finance uh, perspective, uh, many of the NCDs are av avoidable, uh, and or at least their health and uh, financial costs can be postponed through good primary and secondary uh, prevention. Um, and so in, uh, 2014, we had a meeting of both health ministers uh, and ministers uh, of finance, a world first, we understand, and, and we, they endorsed the, uh, what we call the Pacific NCD uh, roadmap. So the roadmap uh, includes uh, just a few things for which there's evidence of effectiveness, First one is to strengthen uh, tobacco control, mainly through increases in the tobacco tax, uh, reduce consumption of uh, food and drink products directly related to obesity, um, and to try to improve the efficiency and impact of existing uh, health dollars, this is meant to be health dollar, not healthy dollar, um, and strengthening the evidence uh, base for better investment planning and program uh, effectiveness. And so this is uh, 2018, we, um, we've noticed in 16 of the 22 island nations, uh, they've increased tax on uh, tobacco, uh, pretty much uh, near the WHO uh, recommendation. So tobacco in the Cook Islands and Niue are among the most uh, expensive uh, in the world. So that's a uh, pretty good uh, progress. Uh, so unlike New Zealand, 12 of the small island nations have uh, increased tax on soft drinks. Uh, and contrary to the views of some people, increasing tax on soft drinks uh, work, is effective. Uh, so I'm not sure what the, uh, the deal is uh, here. Uh, 14 nations have increased uh, tax on alcohol. We don't think the levels uh, uh, that are being applied are sufficient, so we don't see as much of the impact that we'd like to see on alcohol uh, prices. Alcohol in the region is a bit more expensive, but it's certainly not uh, discouraging uh, drinking. And two of the Pacific Island nations have reduced uh, uh, 
uh, tax on uh, fruits and uh, vegetables. Let me uh, turn now to the climate uh, uh, crisis. This is a WHO uh, graphic. It basically says it doesn't matter where you live, in a rural village or a small town or a big city, you're going to be impacted by some uh, or other aspect of uh, the climate uh, crisis. Uh, the climate crisis, of course, affects uh, the food we eat, the air we breathe, and the water we drink. And this uh, estimate from WHO is widely regarded as a conservative estimate of the additional deaths that can be expected. I, I, just before I progress, I, want, I sh put up the slide from the team at SBC Statistics. Uh, we are a people who live by the sea. So the graphics uh, show that if you take Papua New Guinea out, half the population live within a kilometre of the coast. Uh, and almost 100% live within 10 kilometres of the coast. Uh, why is this important? Well, um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and so the region uh, is widely known to be vulnerable to uh, disasters, uh, even though the contribution from the island nations to the gr harmful greenhouse gases is uh, pretty low and insignificant, but they are the ones who are suffering uh, most from the adverse effects of the climate uh, crisis. The World Economic uh, Forum reports, annual reports, regularly put uh, uh, Vanuatu as the most at-risk nation on the planet, and Tonga as well. But certainly six of our uh, region uh, island nations are in the top uh, 15 uh, countries uh, at risk. When people talk about the climate crisis, this is the picture that people often associate with it. Dramatic uh, pictures of floods or cyclones. Uh, uh, and, and that certainly is a component of the climate crisis and something that we see uh, quite a bit uh, and on a regular basis in the region. <coughs> I do want to say, though, that the more subtle dimensions of the climate crisis sea level rise, and especially ocean acidification and ocean warming is potentially more damaging because ocean warming in particular and ocean acidification leads to coral bleaching. And coral bleaching uh, will threaten the food chain. And as I signaled to you at the beginning, uh, the majority of the population in the region rely on coastal fisheries and seafood for their protein. So as you can imagine, this is a serious uh, uh, risk for many of our uh, populations. Um, but climate, the climate crisis, of course, uh, have um, other aspects such as uh, prolonged droughts in the Federated States of Micronesia and uh, RMI. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, this uh, significant uh, weather events has taken place in the Pacific. And if you look at the second column, it results in significant damage uh, to the economies of many of these uh, islands. And in the case of uh, Vanuatu in 2015, as a result of uh, uh, Cyclone Winston, they lost almost two thirds of their uh, GDP. Significant, uh, significant uh, damage. Um, the climate uh, crisis that I uh, described earlier on, of course, affects the whole, um, uh, whole uh, manner of things, but the ones that I would like to speak about today is on uh, food security and uh, water security. I've, I've spoken a bit uh, already about this. Um, so if we look at uh, water, this is uh, from the work of uh, UNICEF. Uh, this is uh, s access to sanitation. Uh, it's improving elsewhere in the world. But for us in the region, it's actually declining. And if you look at water, 
access to clean water here on the right. Again, the world is improving, but for us in the region, it's, uh, it's only a marginal uh, improvement. And you can deduce from this that uh, access to clean water is problematic already. And when you have uh, saltwater inundation and other effects of climate change, you will further compromise access to clean water in the region. And most of it is in, uh, again, in Melanesia uh, and to some extent uh, Micronesia. Uh, things are obviously a lot better in Polynesia. Uh, this is access to water. If we turn now to uh, food security, uh, this is a publication that we put out on the projected impacts of the climate uh, crisis on food security in the region. These are the various uh, aspects, the various uh, uh, consequences of the climate uh, crisis um, affecting the production of uh, food in our region. And the experts uh, tell me that the coastal fisheries harvest is expected to halve by 20, 2100 due to overfishing, to pollution, to ocean acidification, and the indirect effects of uh, habitat uh, destruction. Um, the pelagic uh, fish, uh, tuna, big fish, is expected to move east, which is making uh, French Polynesia excited. Most of the tuna at the moment can be found in the central and western Pacific uh, uh, towards uh, Solomon Islands and uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, and, and of course other effects uh, on, on uh, low-lying um, atolls. And we've spoken already on the effects of uh, climate acidification. Um, the other thing I just want to speak briefly about is uh, vector-borne diseases, mainly dinghy. Um, considerable increase in uh, air travel. Um, and in recent months, we've seen dinghy pretty much uh, constant uh, around the region. Um, and so uh, to the end of uh, August last year, we've had uh, 76 uh, newly reported uh, arboviral infection outbreaks, mainly dinghy. Um, 49 of the 76 outbreaks uh, were dengue, and for the first time we saw all four dengue strains circulating in the region. Um, uh, Chick and uh, uh, Zika appears to have gone uh, quiet uh, last year, but this is uh, again something that of uh, potential uh, significance uh, for our region. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the issue now for us is that pretty much all four of the strain uh, of dengue is circulating uh, in the region. This is one of my favorite uh, photographs. Um, this is a photograph of the maternity ward in Tarawa and Kiribati. So uh, it's not uh, idle. Uh, threats that we're talking about for those who, who remain skeptical about uh, the climate crisis uh, it's real and if you're a mother about to have a baby in uh, Tarawa you can imagine it's not a very uh, safe uh, prospect uh, so this is a uh, it's somebody's photo it's not uh, it's not mine so the regional response to the climate crisis is led by the World Health Organization. In uh, last year, they um, had, had a meeting and developed uh, what's called the um, uh, climate, uh, the WHO WHO uh, initiative on climate change and health in small island developing states, uh, in conjunction with the UNFCCC and the Fiji government when they were chair of uh, COP23, uh, and this was launched at the World Health Assembly last year. Basically got four uh, lines of action, empowerment, evidence, implementation, and uh, resources. On empowerment, this is about developing and supporting 
regional and global uh, leadership to advocate uh, for change. On evidence, this is building the evidence case for further investment in the, um, uh, responding to uh, the climate uh, crisis through mitigation and adaptation uh, interventions. Implementation is about building resilient health systems, developing health promoting mitigation policies and so on. And resources, of course, is about access to finances. So that's the blueprint that uh, is being offered uh, around the region and we are helping uh, with that process. Um, let me turn now to the issue of uh, research. The research uh, priorities. Um, without a doubt in my mind, the priority is to try to identify the interventions uh, that work. We've been at the NCD prevention and control business for some years now, but the results are disappointing. And so for me, those of you who are thinking about research uh, opportunities, it's really about trying to identify how to improve the impact of the work that we're doing and what works for NCD prevention and control in the region. Um, because there's actually been very little by way of a positive impact of the work that's been done over the last 10 to 20 years. And for me, I think the priority is on trying to identify those uh, interventions. Uh, and as a component of that, I think it's actually about qualitative studies on context, on the social cultural concepts and the constructs. Because I think we have uh, quite a lot of technical uh, scientific interventions, but the impact and the implementation is not quite uh, what is uh, needed. And certainly in the region, I think there's a big missing part on uh, mental health and well-being, and particularly as a result of the climate uh, crisis. Um, uh, most of you will probably be aware of the Pacific Committee of the New Zealand Health Research Council. Uh, they are a, a, a funder. I'm aware that uh, MFAT uh, supports research. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the priorities there are, uh, Helen. Uh, we have um, uh, some resource, uh, we being SBC, we have some resource uh, dedicated to research, particularly with our partners such as uh, WHO and the regional uh, institutions. Those who want to find out more information about that, I'd be happy to talk to you after this. Uh, the Pacifica Medical Association uh, supports uh, some research in the region. PIHO is the Northern Pacific uh, organization uh, representing the American affiliated states uh, uh, they're a bit like uh, PMA. And a recent development uh, between US uh, SBC and the University of Queensland on uh, the Health Governance Network. And uh, limited in many ways, but individual Pacific Island Medical Association, nursing associations uh, also support uh, some uh, research. Not sure why this is uh, sluggish. So what do I, what, what's my shopping list? What would I do? Uh, in uh, 2013, the ministers of health adopted the tobacco-free Pacific. But th there's really no implementation or follow through on this. And I think the burden of illness from tobacco in the Pacific is such that implementing the tobacco-free Pacific 2025 should be a priority and there has to be some clearly identified actions and resources and support to implement. Uh, Tobacco Free Pacific 2025 is a noble aspiration, but at the moment it's just a hollow, uh, inadequate, uh, inadequately supported uh, concept. So I would put uh, energy and resources into implementing Tobacco Free Pacific 2025. Um, we would want to encourage all Pacific Island nations to act with more urgency in the implementation of the NCD uh, roadmap. Um, 
the trade in food has to receive some attention at some point. Most of the island nations can grow and produce the food they need. But most of them are importing a lot of processed food and drink. Uh, considerable under treatment of diabetes and hypertension and we know what works so uh, ensure consistent supply of uh, cost-effective uh, medication some nations still spend way way low uh, below the recommended levels of uh, of their GDP in health I think there's probably need to look at a regional pool uh, of funds for combating non-communicable uh, uh, diseases. And I think the Forum Island Leaders item agreed last year is an opportunity to revisit uh, uh, some of this. And, and of course, I think uh, we need to be better prepared for uh, impacts of the climate change, uh, such as uh, water and sanitation. Uh, so how can uh, New Zealand assist? Uh, I've Coming to the end of um, the slides now, I think New Zealand is doing a great job on global advocacy in respect of the climate crisis. And I would and certainly encourage the New Zealand government to continue to do that and to use their influence globally because this is something that's appreciated uh, by folk in the region. Uh, so I would encourage uh, a continuation of uh, advocacy on behalf of the small islands of the Pacific. Uh, I mentioned the fact that we need more resources for NCD prevention and uh, control. Um, the current resource allocation is, is grossly inadequate. I, I'm aware of some of the positive uh, experiences in New Zealand, particularly in uh, tobacco control, that we could uh, learn from. Um, and uh, I, I, there's a risk that people would raise uh, mutton flaps when I put this here. Uh, but I do think it goes uh, both ways. Um, and I think there's a real need for better preparedness in respect of the health impacts of uh, climate change. For example, the implementation of the WHO plan that I mentioned, uh, and perhaps uh, better accountability in respect of who does what. Sorry, and just to finish off uh, by way of a few points on this uh, last slide, I think the potential for a high quality of life is there in the region, but we are way short of, of uh, that at the moment. And there are significant inequalities that exist between island nations and also within island nations. There's some prospects, uh, encouraging prospects, such as a decline in mortality in children, but there are equally concerning trends, uh, such as a decline in uh, life expectancy. Uh, NCDs, of course, is the major public health uh, problem. And the, our current efforts, I think, are poorly resourced at the present time, and we need to look at that again. Uh, and the, of course, the threats of the, the climate crisis threatens fundamental uh, live, uh, livelihoods, and I do think we need firmer actions and policy interventions in that uh, respect. Um, and that's uh, it. Thank you very much.